Section 8 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Chapter 7. A breath of a lethal gas shot from the flying ship had made Captain Blake as helpless as if every muscle were frozen hard, and he had got it only lightly, mixed with the saving blast of oxygen. His heart had gone on, and his breathing, though it became shallow, did not cease. He was even able to turn his eyes. But to the men in the observatory room, the gas from the weapons of the attacking force came as a devastating, choking cloud that struck them senseless as if with a blow. Lieutenant McGuire hardly heard the sound of his own pistol before unconsciousness took him. It was death for the men who were left. For them the quick darkness never lifted. But for McGuire and his companion there was reprieve. He was lying flat on a hard floor when remembrance crept slowly back to his benumbed brain. An odor, sickish sweet, was in his nostrils. The breath of life was being forcibly pumped and withdrawn from laboring lungs. A mask was tight against his face. He struggled to throw it off, and someone bending over removed it. Someone! His eyes stared wonderingly at the grotesque face like a lingering phantasm of fevered dreams. There were others, he saw, and they were working over a body not far away upon the floor. He recognized the figure of Professor Sykes. Short, stocky, his clothes disheveled, but Sykes, unmistakably, despite the mask upon his face. He too revived as McGuire watched, and like the flyer he looked wonderingly about him at his strange companions. The eyes of the two met, and held in wordless communication and astonishment. The unreal creatures that hovered near withdrew to the far side of the room. The walls beyond them were of metal, white and gleaming. There were doorways. In another wall were portholes, round windows of thick glass that framed circles of absolute night. It was dark out beyond them with a blackness that was relieved only by sharp pinpoints of brilliance, stars in a night sky such as McGuire had never seen. Past and present alike were hazy to the flyer. The spark of life had been brought back to his body from a far distance. There was time needed to part the unreal from the real in these new and strange surroundings. There were doorways in the ceiling, and others in the floor near where he lay. Ladders fastened to the wall gave access to these doors. A grotesque figure appeared above the floor, and after a curious glance at the two men, scrambled into the room and vanished through the opening in the ceiling. It was some time before the significance of this was plain to the wandering man, before he reasoned that he was in the enemy ship, aimed outward from the earth, and the pull of gravitation and the greater force of the vessel's constant acceleration held its occupants to the rear walls of each room. That lanky figure had been making its way forward toward the bow of the ship, McGuire's mind was clearing. He turned his attention now to the curious waiting creatures, his captors. There were five of them standing in the room, five shapes like men, yet curiously strangely different. They were tall of stature, narrow across the shoulders, muscular in a lean, attenuated fashion. But their faces! McGuire found his eyes returning in horrified fascination to each hideous, inhuman countenance. A colorless color like the dead gray of ashes, a skin like that of an African savage, from which all but the last vestige of color had been drained. It was transparent, parchment-like, and even in the light of the room that glowed from some hidden source, he could see the throbbing lines of blood vessels that showed livid through the translucent skin. And he remembered now the fingers, half seen in his moments of awakening. They were like clinging tendrils, colorless, too, in that ashy gray and showed the network of veins as if each hand had been flayed alive, trying to find some earthly analogy for these unearthly creatures. Why did he think of potatoes sprouting in a cellar? What possible connection had these half-human things with that boyhood recollection? And he had seen some laboratory experiments with plants and animals that had been cut off from the sunlight, and now the connection was clear. He knew what this idea was that was trying to form. These were creatures of the dark. These bleached, drained faces showed skin that had never known the actinic rays of the sun. Their whole framework proclaimed the process that had been going on through countless generations. Here was a race that had lived, 
if not in absolute darkness, then in some place where sunlight never shone, a place of half-light, or of clouds. Clouds! The exclamation was startled from him. And clouds, he repeated meditatively. He was seeing again a cloud-wrapped world in the eyepiece of a big refracting telescope, blanketed in clouds, Professor Sykes had said. The scientist himself was speaking to him now in bewildered tones. Clouds? he inquired. That's a strange remark to make. Where are we, Lieutenant McGuire? I remember nothing after you fired. Are we flying? In the clouds? A long, long way beyond them is my guess, said McGuire grimly. It was staggering what all this might mean. There was time needed for fuller comprehension. But the lean, bronzed face of the flyer flushed with animation, and in spite of the terrors that must surely lie ahead, he felt strangely elated at the actuality of an incredible adventure. Slowly he got to his feet, to find that his muscles still were reluctant to respond to orders. He helped the professor to arise, and from the group that drew back further into the far end of the room came a subdued and rasping tumult of discordant sound. One, seemingly in charge, held a weapon in his hand, a slender tube no thicker than a common wire, and ending in a cylinder within the creature's hand. He pointed it in threatening fashion while his voice rose in a shrill call. McGuire and Professor Sykes stood quiet, and waited for what the next moment might have in store. But McGuire waved the weapon aside, in a gesture that none could fail to read. "'Steady,' he told his companion. "'We're in a ticklish position. Do nothing to alarm them.' From above them came an answering shrill note. Another of the beings was descending into the room. "'Ah!' said Lieutenant McGuire softly. "'The big boss himself!' Now let's see what will happen." If there had seemed something of timidity in the repulsive faces of the waiting creatures, this newcomer was of a different type. He opened flabby thin lips to give one sharp note of command. It was as sibilant as the hissing of a snake. The man with the weapon returned it to a holster at his side. The whole group cringed before the power and authority of the new arrival. The men that they had seen thus far were all garbed alike a loose-fitting garment of one piece that was ludicrously like the play-rompers that children might wear. These were dull red in color, the red of drying blood, made of strong woven cloth, but this other was uniformed differently. McGuire noted the fineness of the silky robe. Like the others this was made of one piece, loosely fitting, but its bright vivid scarlet made the first seem drab and dull. A belt of metal about his waist shone like gold and matched the emblem of precious metal in the turban on his head. All this the eyes of the flyer took in at a glance. His attention was only momentarily diverted from the ashen face with eyes narrow and slitted that stared with the cold hatred of a cat into those of the men. He made a sound with a whistling breath. It seemed to be a question directed to them, but the import of it was lost. An exceedingly queer lot, Professor Sykes observed and this chap seems distinctly hostile. "'He's no friend of mine,' said McGuire, as the thin, pendulous lips repeated their whistling interrogation. "'I can't place them,' mused the scientist. "'Those facial characteristics. But they must be of some nationality. Speak some tongue.' He addressed himself to the figure with the immobile, horrid face. "'We do not understand you,' he said with an ingratiating smile. "'Comprenez-vous, Francaise? No?' German, perhaps, or Spanish? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Usted habla Española? He followed with a fusillade of questions in strange and varying tongues. I've even tried him with Chinese. He protested in bewilderment and stared amazed at his companion's laughter. There had to be a reaction from the strain of the past hours, and Lieutenant McGuire found the serious questioning in polygot tongues and the unchanging feline stare of that hideous face too much for his mental restraint. He held his sides, while he shook and roared with laughter beyond control, and the figure before him glared, with evident disapproval of his mirth. There was a hissing order, and two figures from the corner sprang forward to seize the flyer with long clinging fingers. Their strength he had overestimated, for a violent throw of his body twisted him free, and his outstretched hands sent the two sprawling across the room. Their leader took one quick step forward, 
then paused as if hesitating to meet this young adversary. "'Do go easy,' Professor Sykes was imploring. "'We do not know where we are, nor who they are, but we must do nothing to antagonize them.' McGuire had reacted from his hilarious seizure with an emotional swing to the opposite extreme. "'I'll break their damn necks,' he growled, "'if they get rough with me.' And his narrow eyes exchanged glare for glare, with those in the face like blood and ashes before him. The cold cat eyes held steadily upon him while the scarlet figure retreated. A louder call, shrill and vibrant, came from the thin lips, and a swarm of bodies in dull red were scrambling into the room to mass about their scarlet leader. Above and behind them the face under its brilliant turban and golden clasp was glaring in triumph. The tall figures crouched, grotesque and awkward. Their long arms and hands with grasping tendril-like fingers were ready. McGuire waited for the sharp hissing order that would throw these things upon him, and he met the attack when it came with his own shoulders dropped to the fighter's pose, head drawn in close, and both fists swinging free. There were lean fingers clutching at his throat, a press of blood-red bodies thick about him, and a clustering of faces where color blotched and flowed. The thud of fists and blows that started from the floor was new to these lean creatures that clawed and clung like cats. But they trampled on those who went down before the flyer's blows, and stood upon them to spring at his head. They crowded in, in overwhelming numbers, while their red hands tore and twined about his face. It was no place now for long swings. McGuire twisted his body, and threw his weight into quick, short jabs at the faces before him. He was clear for an instant, and swung his heavy boot at something that clung to one leg, then met with a rain of hooks and short punches the faces that closed in again. He saw in that instant a wild whirl of bodies where the stocky figure of Professor Sykes was smothered beneath his taller antagonists. But the professor, if he was forgetting the science of the laboratory, was remembering that of the squared circle, and the battle was not entirely one-sided. McGuire was free. The blood was trickling down his face from innumerable cuts where sharp-nailed fingers had sunk deep. He wiped the red stream from his eyes and threw himself at the weaving mass of bodies that eddied about Sykes in frantic struggle across the room. The face of the professor showed clear for a moment. Like McGuire he was bleeding, and his breath came in short, explosive gasps. But he was holding his own. The eyes of McGuire glimpsed a wildly gesticulating, shouting figure in the rear. The face, contorted with rage, was almost the color of the brilliant scarlet that the creature wore. The blood-stained man in khaki left his companion to fight his own battle, and plunged headlong at a leaping cluster of dull red, smashed through with a frenzied attack of straight rights and lefts, and freed himself to make one final leap at the leader of this unholy pack. He was fighting in blind desperation now. The two were outnumbered by the writhing, lean-bodied creatures and this thing that showed in blurred crimson before him was the directing power of them all. The figure symbolized and personified to the raging man all the repulsive ugliness of the leaping horde. The face came clear before him through the mist of blood, and he put the last ounce of his remaining strength and every pound of weight behind a straight, clean drive with his right fist. His last conscious impression was of a red clawing hand that was closed around the thick butt of a tube of steel. Then down, and still down, he plunged into a bottomless pit of whirling, red flashes and choking fumes. There were memories that were to occur to Lieutenant McGuire afterward, visions, dim and hazy and blurred, of half-waking moments when strange creatures forced food and water into his mouth, then held a mask upon his face while he resisted weakly the breathing of sweet, sickly fumes that sent him back to unconsciousness. There were many such times some when he came sufficiently awake to know that Sykes was lying near him, receiving similar care. Their lives were being preserved. How or why or what life might hold in store, he neither knew nor cared. The mask and the deep-drawn fumes brought stupor and numbness to his brain. A window was in the floor beside him when he awoke, a circular window of thick glass or quartz, but no longer did it frame a picture of a sky in velvet blackness. No unwinking pinpoints of distant stars pricked keenly through the night, but clear and dazzling came a blessed radiance that could mean only sunshine, a glowing light that was dazzling to his sleep-filled eyes, 
It streamed in golden, beautiful, to light the unfamiliar room and show motionless upon the floor the figure of Professor Sykes. His torn clothing had been neatly arranged, and his face showed livid lines of healing cuts and bruises. McGuire tried gingerly to move his arms and legs. They were still functioning, though stiff and weak from disuse. He raised himself slowly and stood swaying on his feet, then made his uncertain way to his companion and shook him weakly by the shoulder. Professor Sykes breathed deeply and raised leaden lids from tired eyes to stare uncomprehendingly at McGuire. Soon his dark pupils ceased to dilate, and he, too, could see their prison and the light of day. "'Sunlight,' he said in a thin voice, and he seemed to know now that they were in the air. "'I wonder—I wonder—' I wonder if we shall land, what country? Some wilderness and a strange race, a strange, strange race. He was muttering half to himself. The mystery of these people whom he could not identify was still troubling him. McGuire helped the other man to his feet, and they clung to each to the other for support as they crossed to kneel beside the floor window and learned finally where their captors meant to take them. A wilderness, indeed, the sight that met their eyes but a wilderness of clouds, no unfamiliar sight to Lieutenant McGuire of the United States Army Air Service, but to settle softly into them instead of driving through with glistening wings, this was new and vastly different from anything he had known. Sounds came to them in the silence, penetrating faintly through thick walls, the same familiar wailing call that trembled and quavered and seemed to the listening men to be guiding them down through the mist. Gone was the sunlight and the clouds beyond the deep-set window were gloriously ablaze with a brilliance softly diffused. The cloud bank was deep, and they felt the craft under them sink slowly, steadily into the misty embrace. It thinned below them to a drifting vapor, and the first hazy shadows of the ground showed through from far beneath. Their altitude, the flyer knew, was still many thousands of feet. Water, said McGuire, as his trained eyes made plain to him what was still indistinct to the scientist, an ocean, and a shoreline. More clouds obscured the view. They parted suddenly to show a portion only of a clear-cut map. It stretched beyond the confines of their window, that unfamiliar line of wave-marked shore. The water was like frozen gold, wrinkled in countless tiny corrugations and reflecting the bright glow from above. But the land, that drew their eyes. Were those cities? those shadow-splashed areas of gray and rose? The last veiling clouds dissolved, and the whole circle was plain to their view. The men leaned forward, breathless, intent, till the scientist, Sykes, the man whose eyes had seen and whose brain recorded a dim shape in the lens of a great telescope, Sykes drew back with a quivering, incredulous breath, for below them, so plain, so unmistakable, there lay an island, large even from this height, and it formed on this round map a sharp angle like a great letter L. "'We shall know that if we ever see it again,' Professor Sykes had remarked in the quiet and security of that domed building surmounting the heights of Mount Lawson. But he said nothing now, as he stared at his companion with eyes that implored McGuire to arouse him from this sleep, this dream that could never be real. But McGuire, lieutenant one time in the forces of the U.S.A., had seen it too, and he stared back with a look that gave dreadful confirmation. The observatory, Mount Lawson, the earth, those were the things unreal and far away. And here before them, in brain-stunning actuality, were the markings unmistakable, the markings of Venus. And they were landing, these two, in the company of creatures wild and strange as the planet, on Venus itself. End of chapter 7 To be continued